Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our Fall 2020 Town Hall. I am Christy Tostevin, Vice President of University Communications, and I will be moderating our discussion tonight. Um, I am obviously joining you live from beautiful Chapel Walk, or at least through the magic of Zoom, I am. Um, for all you students watching, we can't wait until you're here with us on the Hill um, in this beautiful background. Um, I just wanna give you a little update on how the process will go tonight. So you're aware of how we'll proceed. Um, I will actually first send, um, hand it over to President Weinberg who will provide some opening remarks and then we will transition to a moderated Q&A format. Thank you so much for all of the questions that you pre-submitted. We received so many great ones. We won't be able to get to all of them tonight but we are prioritizing those that were submitted most frequently. So we know those are most top of mind um, for students and families. So we'll prioritize those and we will save some time at the end um, for any questions that you submit while we're on um, the session tonight, you can do that. There's a link right below the YouTube video where you can click and submit your questions. I also will say that um, even though we can't get to everything, we are committed to answering all your questions and um, you can continue to visit our reopen website, um, uh, reopen.denison.edu. Um, we will continue to update information there. We'll also continue to provide information in our weekly newsletters that are coming to students and families. And we encourage you to, if you have questions after this that aren't answered in any of those formats, you can email us at reopen.denison.edu. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to President Weinberg. Great, thanks, Christy. And, um, and thanks everybody for joining us tonight. We, we appreciate your time and, um, and, and your commitment to the college. You know, I just, I'm gonna keep my comments short, but, but I just wanted to open up with, with three um, kind of sets of, of observations and comments. The, the first is um, I've been in higher education a long time and, and I have um, never been on a campus where I've seen people work as hard as I have at Denison over the, over the last couple of months. And so I, I just, I wanna express my gratitude. I actually wanna start with that. It, everybody at Denison who's just put in an extraordinary amount of time this summer, helping us plan for the fall. Um, people have been working around the clock because they care about the college and they're committed to our students and they wanna see us have a great year. Um, if, for anybody who's been reading the paper or paying attention to what's going on across higher ed, um, colleges are making a wide range of choices and decisions about the fall. Um, everything about COVID remains fluid. Um, we've decided to, to uh, go into a hybrid format in the fall. Um, and, and we've done that for a couple different reasons. The, the first is um, we believe, and I think you'll hear more tonight that I hope um, will be helpful to hear, that we can manage the COVID virus on our campus in the fall. Um, there's a lot of things that are unique about Denison. Um, our size, we're not particularly large, um, but we happen to have a large footprint, lots of space, both indoors and outdoors. Um, our single focus, we, we only focus on one thing, which is undergraduate students. Um, our location, right, both up on the hill and somewhat near a city, but removed from it. And quite frankly, our financial resources just give us a range of tools, a set of unique circumstances, our proximity um, to Ohio State in a world-class uh, medical research facility. Um, all allows us to, to be able to do this. But the second is we, we're in a hybrid format this fall because we really, we understand and we respect um, that there are just some families and some students who don't feel comfortable coming back to campus in the fall or who can't for a variety of reasons. And we wanna make sure that we can give all of our students a world-class education, whether they're on campus or they're gonna be remote in the fall. The, the final reason is a hybrid format has allowed us to do some planning that will allow us to really manage anything that comes our way. Um, everything about the COVID virus remains fluid. Um, and we just believe that we need maximum flexibility. So as Provost Copeland talks tonight and some others, I think you'll get a sense that we've just put a lot of pieces in place to be able to, to pivot um, and to respond um, to anything that, that really comes our way um, during the fall semester. Here's the second thing I wanna acknowledge. Um, this year will not be a typical year. It just isn't. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't be or won't be a great year. Um, this is going to be a year that's going to be unpredictable. It is a year that is going to require all of us to lean into our liberal arts skills and values, to be agile, to be flexible, um, to be problem solvers, to, to work as a community, to be resilient. Um, it is a year that's going to ask a lot of us. Um, and it's really going to require every student every faculty member and every staff member, every member of this community to come together, to step in this space, to do what we need to do to protect our own health, but also to do what's right for the entire community. Um, we're Denisonians, and I believe that's deep in our DNA, and it is the Denison way. Um, here's the third. Um, different doesn't mean it can't be unique, 
Different doesn't mean it can't be important. And different doesn't mean that we can't look back at the end of this year with a tremendous amount of pride of what we've done together. My great hope is that this time next year, we will look back and say, yeah, last year was hard. It had some challenging moments, but boy, are we proud of what we managed to accomplish together. It was an exceptional year, an exceptional year for our students and an exceptional year for, for the campus. Um, it was a great year for students who are both on campus and students who are remote. Um, our faculty have been hard at work um, putting together courses, um, doing a lot of innovation around the curriculum to make sure that we can deliver a world-class, highly engaging, high quality set of courses to students both on campus and remote. Um, we will continue to be a highly engaged campus, right? At its core, Denison is about relationships. It's about the friendships we form with each other. It's about the relationships with faculty and staff. It's about our involvement, both in the classroom and highly engaged classes, but also our involvements across campus and all of our student organizations, student government and other kinds of things. All of that are things that we are gonna find a way to do this year. Um, there will be social life, right? College should be fun. It should be one of many things. We're gonna have to do it different, but you know what, Denison's at its best when we're being creative and often when we're doing things in some smaller groups. So we, will, we are hard at work thinking through and working with students. And I wanna thank the Red Frame Lab and the Red Core Fellows for all the work they've been doing on those issues. Um, and then lastly, I think this is a year where we're all gonna grow and learn. We're gonna grow and learn from each other. We're gonna grow and learn as we meet some challenges together. Um, it is a year where we will look back on and be proud of our skills of adaptability, of agility and perseverance. Um, so let me just kind of close with just a, I guess, kind of a personal statement. Um, the situation we find ourselves in is not a situation that any of us want to be in. Um, it's not something that we want to be going through, but it's the situation we find ourselves in. It's what's in front of us. For me, if I have to go through something like this, there isn't a college, there isn't a group of students, there's not a group of faculty or staff that I'd rather go through this with or for than this college and this group of students. I'm proud to be a Denisonian. I'm super inspired um, by the Denison way and all the ways we're leaning into the challenges in front of us. Um, and I'm excited about the ways that we will work together this year to be creative, to be agile, to take the journey together, to make sure that all of our students have a great academic year, both in a great year outside the classroom as well. So I went in there, I'll hand it back to you, Christy. Thank you so much, President Weinberg. I'm gonna ask before we start the Q&A session if um, all of our leaders on the phone could please introduce themselves. Uh, Alexandra Schimmer, General Counsel. I'm Kim Copeland, Provost. Alex Miller, Vice President of Student Development. Nan Carney DeBoer, Director of Athletics. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. So Kim, we're gonna start off with you and we're gonna spend some time talking about academics. So um, President Weinberg talked a little bit about the hybrid model, but I'm wondering if you can give us some more detail about uh, what that it looks like and how faculty are thinking about and preparing. Sure, Christy, thanks, thanks for asking. So I'll start by saying that faculty have been, been preparing for a hybrid approach to the fall semester since late last spring. What I mean by hybrid in this case is that faculty are preparing for some of their students to be on campus attending classes in person and for some of their students to be joining the class remotely. This hybrid approach naturally allows for us to have de-densification of our classes, but most importantly, it allows us to engage all of our students, including those who can't return to campus or those who choose not to return to campus. The hybrid approach that our faculty are preparing for also allows for academic continuity for a student who may need to isolate or quarantine and transition to remote learning for a temporary period during the semester. Faculty have also been using the time this summer to really, as they think about their hybrid approach, they're focusing on engaging all of their students, students who are joining remotely and students who are in classes face to face. They wanna have all these student experiences be as parallel as possible. This is a key feature of the hybrid approach that we started talking with faculty about late last spring. Thank you, Kim. Um, one of the questions that we received um, from students who were on campus in the spring and we had to transition to um, uh, a remote kind of unexpectedly in the spring, um, 
students are wondering how, if they are remote this spring, the experience might, or this fall, the experience might be different than, than what they experienced in the spring. Sure. So I think everybody knows that as we made the transition in the spring, we transitioned to remote teaching and learning very, very quickly. And so a lot of our focus in terms of helping faculty prepare and, and be, um, you know, transition to remote teaching was just simply training to help get them comfortable with the various technologies that they needed to use to, to engage with students remotely. Um, obviously, we have a little bit more time to prepare for the fall semester now. So we're engaging faculty in a lot of workshops and conversations that are being facilitated by our Center for Learning and Teaching focused on the pedagogy of hybrid learning and remote remote teaching. Um, we've our educational technology services unit in our IT division has also been doing a lot of, of training of our faculty. So we've just taken advantage of the time that we have this summer, the additional time to really help our faculty um, think about, you know, from a more thoughtful, informed, um, you know, what kind of pedagogical approach do they want to use for their classes this fall. We did learn a lot of things about remote learning and remote teaching in the spring. Um, one of the things that we learned was that many students and many faculty found Zoom to be a better platform. So one of the things that we've done is acquired a campus-wide Zoom license for this fall. Another lesson learned by a number of faculty was that breaking their class into small groups into more intensive, individualized Oxford-style Oxford tutorials was quite effective, even when they were engaging with their students remotely. And I know that numerous faculty are planning to use this intensive tutorial model either individ with individual students or with small groups small groups this this um, this fall another big difference between the spring and the fall is that in the spring faculty and students had been in the classroom together for eight weeks before we transitioned to remote learning so getting to know students and how that how those relationships are going to be formed is definitely on the minds of faculty and they're thinking about how they're going to get to know students even when those relationships are being built and developed at a distance and, and maybe over a remote platform instead of in person. So I expect that many faculty, and I think a handful have already started, are gonna be reaching out to students to talk about what the course is gonna look like, to introduce themselves as the, as the faculty member, and just to begin to engage with the students even before the semester, the semester starts. Another difference um, about courses this fall is we realized that it would be helpful as we go into a fall semester with some unknowns and some uncertainty if faculty thought about their courses and thought about the work in those courses being spread out more evenly over the semester. That will help us pivot during the semester if a student needs to transition to remote learning or comes back from remote to in-person learning. It'll help us if a faculty member needs to make a similar transition. So these built-in breakpoints that we're encouraging faculty to to build into their courses will just help us pivot and make transitions in ways that we weren't prepared to do in, in the spring semester. And let me, um, let me just say a word about the different approaches that faculty are planning to use for the fall. There are just gonna be a variety of approaches. They're gonna be probably unique to each, each course and unique to each individual faculty member. Um, some classes will meet um, at, a you know, at the regularly scheduled time. They'll meet synchronously. The in-person students will be in a classroom and the remote student students will be joining via Zoom. So we're equipping classrooms with technology to allow that to happen. Some faculty would much prefer, prefer to provide content in um, pre-recorded videos so that students can watch those on their own time. So this would be an asynchronous version. And then the faculty member would meet in small groups either with students in person or remotely. So depending on how those small groups could work. Another difference for the classroom is going to be that masks are going to be required for all students and faculty. So faculty are thinking about the impact of what does it mean to wear masks. And for example, it might make sense if students are doing presentations to have the students record those presentations in advance so that they don't have to mask during the presentation. And then faculty will think about how best to engage the course in the presentation. A couple other things and then I'll wrap up my answer to this question. Our faculty in the arts and sciences are really thinking creatively about how to deliver those courses that are a little bit more challenging to do in a remote format. So some music ensembles may rehearse outside as much as it's possible. Some science labs may be done entirely remotely, or some labs may use lab groups that have a mixture of in-person and remote students, with each student having a different responsibility for their part of the lab project. 
And I know that one science department is going to offer a boot camp laboratory experience at a later time. So after the semester, when we're more back to normal for students who aren't able to get to campus and ha have a hands on lab experience this fall. And then I just want to close with this final point that um, Many faculty are really thinking creatively about how to use this opportunity. This is a difficult moment for all of us, but our faculty are being creative and innovative and they're saying this is an opportunity that we can take advantage of. And one faculty member recently said to me, um, he said, a college education today requires students to gain competence in synchronously interacting with in-person and remote peers. This isn't just a COVID thing. This will soon become the norm for most professional settings, and it's an exciting skill to begin cultivating with Denison's small classes. It's also a marketable skill. What organization would want, wouldn't want employees who can solve problems by facilitating in-person, remote, and global group work? So I just love how our faculty are thinking about taking advantage of this, of this challenging moment to really say, yeah, there are some great things that we can do in this moment that will really benefit our students. Thank you, Kim. Apologize for that. Um, how many people have been on a Zoom call and have <laughs> heard that you're muted, you're muted. So I apologize. Um, one more question, Kim, um, before we move on, you, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, how hybrid would work, but could you talk about what this means for, for faculty? Will they be in the classrooms? Will they be remote? And how will that work? Yeah, well, I'm sure it's not surprising to anyone that we have a number of faculty who fall into higher risk categories in terms of being vulnerable to COVID, or they might live with someone who's higher risk. So we felt that the best thing was to really give faculty the option to choose how they were going to approach their courses this fall. And at this time, the feedback that I have from faculty, we anticipate that about 15% of our classes are gonna be taught where the faculty member is fully remote. So the faculty member will, um, likely not be on campus much, much at all during the semester. But the vast majority, the rest, beyond that 15% of our classes are gonna have um, most likely both remote and in-person components. Some classes will be mostly in-person, some classes will have a mix of remote and in-person components. So a faculty member might opt to teach a class remotely using Zoom, and then they might come to campus to meet with students either individually or in small groups, and they might do those smaller group meetings face-to-face. Other faculty members are saying, no, I wanna meet my, my entire class in person, but then I'm gonna do those one-on-one -on -one and smaller group interactions remotely. But I will say that regardless of the approach that they're choosing, faculty are, are really focused on providing a meaningful experience for all of their students. As Adam mentioned, Denison is a highly relational place and even the faculty who are planning to teach their, their classes with the faculty member being remote are thinking about ways to develop the important relationships they wanna have with their students. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna switch topics right now and spend a little bit of time talking about health and wellness. And before we get started, we have somebody very important with us tonight on the call. So I'm gonna ask him to introduce himself. Oh, we, we can wait all night for that, but I'll introduce myself in the meantime. Uh, my name is Peter Moeller. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at the Wexter Medical Center at Ohio State. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And um, that actually leads into our next question, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw to Alexandra. We've consulted with a lot of people in developing the plan. So can you just talk a little bit about um, who we did consult with um, before we get into the details of what that plan looks like? Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, we, throughout this process, um, have really been anchoring to science and to data with our North Star question being, what is the smartest uh, strategy, public health strategy, medical strategies for Denison? We've been anchoring to CDC guidance, State of Ohio guidance, um, and also to um, and also working very closely with our county health department. We speak with them every week, sometimes multiple times a week, and are very close partners with them. And we have been so fortunate to have a core of medical, scientific, public health experts. Uh, to really consult with about the development of our protocols. And chief among these partners has been uh, Peter and his colleagues at Ohio State. Uh, Denison is so fortunate. One of the great, great things about being uh, located in the greater Columbus metro area is having Ohio State just down the road, a nationally and internationally renowned academic medical center that is on the leading edge of 
uh, COVID testing development, as well as COVID uh, scientific medical uh, research as well. And they have been wonderful partners in uh, doing deep dives with us on our protocols, helping us develop testing plans, helping us think through containment practices. Uh, in addition, we've been fortunate to have uh, consultants in a range of other areas as well, from Emory, from Cornell, uh, con uh, consultations with uh, MRI Global, which is a nonprofit research institute here in the Midwest, been established for a very long time, since 1944, one of the main research partners for the Department of Defense and Department of Energy on exactly things like um, biological events. Um, they have been wonderful to help us think through issues related to viral transmission uh, and then other sorts of experts as well, environmental health and safety, issues related to air quality and safety. Um, so we've really been anchoring to data and science uh, and to the really wonderful experts we've been privileged to uh, partner with in developing our protocols. Um, and as Christy noted, um, uh, Peter Moeller is here uh, with us tonight and has really just been a wonderful friend uh, to Dennis in, in, in really thinking through everything with us. Um, and I'm going to turn the question to him uh, to share a little bit just preliminarily about, you know, just kind of to give the overview. Many people are following this, obviously, over the course of these many months, but to give us the, the understanding, the high level understanding of where we are with the science of, of what COVID is and COVID transmission and what we know about the virus and how it spreads. Yeah. So, so first, thanks again. Thanks for again for having me. Um, for the folks that are that are watching the Zoom call, I, I, just a couple of quick comments before we start talking about science is, is how incredibly thoughtful the leadership at Denison has been throughout this whole process and really asking a lot of very challenging questions to us in the medical and the scientific field with first and foremost, sort of one, two, three, and four on the list is the safety of of the people in the in the Denison community. So I really give give the leadership a lot of credit for how they're taking care of of the of the kids that are coming back to school as well as the faculty and staff. So we've um, we've been working with this COVID virus for the last pretty much every day for the last five months, like a lot of you. But but in our world, they have gotten very close to this, and it's sort of like if you were dating. We, you know, we started off not knowing anything about this date, and and today we we know. Um, Unfortunately, too much about this, and and so we we you know we have about a hundred active COVID protocols at Ohio State, which range everything from the testing, all the way to some of the vaccines that have been being developed, um, treatments, how it impacts your lung, but importantly, how it impacts um, kids and staff um, that are happening at Denison. And so we have a lot of experience. Um, we've we've learned a lot about. Um, how the virus is changing, how the virus spread has changed. Um, and so I have a lot of good comments that, that this is not simply just sort of a conversation with, with one night with Dennis and leadership, but an ongoing understanding of what are we learning on a daily basis? How do we communicate with Dennis and leadership? Um, we've learned a lot about how the virus is spread and how easy things like masks can have a big, a, a big difference how social distancing and what we like to call now physical distancing instead of social distancing can make a, a, a huge difference. Um, how do we set up, um, how do we set up dorm rooms? How do we set up tables in a dining hall? And um, just, just incredibly impressed with the thoughtfulness of, of how Denison has been working really tirelessly the last few months to, to create an approach that is going to be not only very safe, um, but enable the students to really come out of this with a positive learning experience that's, again, focused on science, but, but really um, making a difference in, in, in their lives going forward. So um, very appreciative of the opportunity to work with you on this. Thank you so much. So um, Alexandra, based on that, um, all of the incredible work that has gone into consulting and identifying our plan, can you just talk at a high level um, what that plan looks like? Sure. So our plan has really multiple components. Um, so at a high level, component one is really prevention. And prevention involves the constellation of health strategies that you're all aware of. One and foremost, as Peter just said, you know, we have a requirement for face coverings for students, for faculty and staff. This isn't just Denison's own role. This is the state of Ohio is requiring this as part of higher education reopening standards. Uh, physical distance and guidelines about gatherings classroom spaces, dining halls are all being uh, reconfigured this summer uh, to facilitate the twin goals of interaction and engagement on the one hand, uh, but also physical distancing. There's a lot of moving of furniture on campus this summer. Hand washing, the stocking of hand sanitizers and hand sanitizing stations everywhere, cleaning and disinfection uh, protocols, all sorts of enhanced protocols, 
uh, supplies, machines, practices, teams, uh, all being rolled out and going into effect. That at a high level is the snapshot of prevention. Then there's the component that I would call, um, in essence, surveillance. So there's daily symptom uh, monitoring requirements for, again, all students, faculty, and staff. Um, you will have uh, an app deployed that students are going to start practicing on in the lead up to return to campus. Um, and this app is going to run everybody through the full slate of symptoms uh, each day and also require a temperature check, although not just the temperature check. There's a lot of talk about the fevers and that's important. We will have temperature checks as part of it. Um, but we are also anchoring to the science of what are the more, what are the also common the symptoms um, that are that are evident in the population of young adults. So really, um, attuning and educating um, our student um, population to the significance of the sudden loss of uh, sense of taste or smell. This app is gonna run through these symptoms every day. And it's, really, and it's not just the sort of mindfulness, remember to do the symptoms and check the box on the app. Um, this app also will then trigger, in essence, a, a badge on a smartphone uh, that will show that you did your daily symptom check for the day, it'll have the date on it. And then this badge is essentially going to um, be used. Um, it's the badge that you'll flash to get into your classroom for your in-person instruction, into dining halls. Um, so the, the badge kind of has this kind of skin in the game element to it, or the app has the skin in the game element to it, in addition to running uh, everybody through uh, the, slate of, the slate of symptoms. Um, so that's surveillance. Uh, and then there's a whole uh, slate of uh, containment strategies. So this is testing. It is the contact tracing and follow-up to uh, testing. It's the quarantine and isolation protocols for students who have either tested positive or who are suspected of potentially being infected or of having, having had contact with an infected person. And then there is at a 10,000 foot level, I'll talk about it a little bit more, um, a community viral tracking project. This is where we're going to be gathering and keeping on a daily basis um, really important data. How many tests are being administered? How many people are in quarantine or isolation? looking at it as to kind of a heat map and looking at the big picture um, so that we can try to identify, do we notice or observe any kind of suspicions or signals of outbreak that we can get on top of aggressively. So prevention, surveillance and containment, each of those um, categories with a lot of subcomponents um, is really the overall framework for our planning. Thank you so much. And probably one of, the, not probably, definitely, the question that we received most frequently was about testing protocol. So can you walk us through Denison's plans? Yeah, sure. I will take the first part of this and then um, I, I know um, Hira will have important and helpful things to, to share about um, the science uh, behind the decisions about testing. Um, first thing is our testing partner is Ohio State. Ohio State in conjunction with uh, Battelle Memorial Institute, another nonprofit research institute um, here in uh, the Midwest and actually here in Columbus, uh, longstanding research institute with a very strong program in uh, sort of biological research um, is, uh, has been, with Ohio State has developed uh, really one of the most reliable tests in the country um, in terms of reliability, in terms of the small uh, percentage of false negatives uh, and a fast turnaround time, a six hour lab processing time, um, max one to two days, depending upon when the samples get picked up, lab volume, but really fast. The private labs that um, a lot of people are using, you have to ship out to a centralized facility, that takes two days, and then the processing at this point can take anywhere from three to seven days more. So in Ohio State, just up the road, we really just have a, a very um, high, um, highly reliable, high quality test um, that is also fast. Um, we also have on our campus in our student health center, um, Abbott Labs rapid uh, test processing. So the OSU test, we will do the swabbing on our campus. Our own health center clinical staff will do the swabbing there. The lab sam the samples will be sent out to the OSU lab for processing. The Abbott test allows us to do um, the swabbing on campus and the test processing, the reading, the, the analysis on our campus. The Abbott test is a 15 minute test. We're not using the Abbott test as our primary mode of testing because it still has too high of a false negative rate for our comfort level. Meaning if you're tested through the Abbott test, 15 minutes later, you get a negative. We're not comfortable sending you off back into the student population because we're not confident that the negative test is gonna be reliable. Um, but what we do know is that the Abbott test is highly reliable for classically symptomatic people who then test positive. So if you test positive on the Abbott test, you are positive for COVID. Um, if you test negative on our Abbott test, we will right away give you the OSU test. So OSU is our top line testing partner, but we will have the Abbott tests on hand for very classically sort of very symptomatic people where we can get that 15 minute um, read. 
Um, and the protocol specifically for testing has three components. One is ample testing for diagnostic testing. That's people who are coming in with symptoms who are being tested to determine if the symptoms actually are COVID. That's one. Two is testing uh, in follow-up to contact tracing. So contact tracing, as you know, is the process that follows once a person has been diagnosed as being infected. Um, there's, a, there's a whole kind of questioning process and an investigative process that looks to identify who are the person's close contacts within the period of time when they are suspected of having been contagious. We will do that contact tracing and then we will test the very close contacts uh, that emerge uh, uh, within that infected person's circle. And we would be doing that in order, not necessarily to shorten the amount of the quarantine for the contact, um, which we wouldn't do. We're gonna keep people in the full quarantine out of an abundance of caution. But testing of contacts allows us to know if that person is positive, then we would start testing their circle of contacts. So it's a layer of aggressive containment that we're layering into our um, testing protocol. So that's symptom testing, contact tracing testing. And then the third component is surveillance testing. And surveillance testing can really take um, many forms. You could have mass scale testing where you just test an entire population all at once or maybe two, three times over the course of a semester. Or you could have um, a kind of more targeted form of surveillance testing. And we've really talked um, with our colleagues at Ohio State and others, really, and, and the advice that we keep getting is that the best kind of testing is the smartest testing for your community and for your institution. And what has emerged as the smartest form of testing for our institution is something called signal testing, which is where we will take a percentage of the Denison community, students and employees, um, a percentage, a slice, and we will test a percentage each week. So we're not testing everybody all at once, just you know, a handful, two or three times, but we will test consistently a percentage every single week. Um, and signal testing has the, the advantage of allowing us to really kind of detect these signals of possible outbreak. Um, signal testing also has the advantage of allowing us to deploy some of our supply of signal testing if we needed to in a smart way, which is to say, we can chase our suspicions down. If we notice that we have a handful of people maybe who are in infection, hopefully we don't, I hope we don't have any, but if we have an infection or if we have a number of people in quarantine or with certain kinds of symptoms that we observe being in a certain residence hall, because we're gonna be able to track that um, in a residence hall or within a certain organization or class or athletic team, um, we can deploy an, uh, a percentage of our signal testing to kind of test our suspicions and see if uh, we detect any signals of outbreak within say a certain residence hall. So those are really the three components, symptom testing, contractation follow-up, and then it's surveillance testing in the form of signal testing. Thank you so much. I'm gonna um, ask Peter uh, this next question um, because Alexander brought it up, mass testing, um, and Denison is not doing mass testing, but can you talk a little bit about why, um, why not mass testing and why is signal testing the right choice um, for Denison? Yeah, so I think I think that Alexandra really nicely put together a, a very compelling case for for how Denison is is moving forward. I think if you were to look at a um, hundred different organizations, as she mentioned, each one of them is going to have a, a plan that works best for for them. There are some advantages that your president brought up very early in terms of the geography of 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 Denison, uh, the fact that you have an incredibly robust um, student health center. Um, you know, the fact that most people live on campus, the fact that, you know, there's, there's 63 different reasons that, that this plan, I think, is one of the best I've seen, um, but also so something that can be done. When I get, we, when we do this often, when I get that question from whether it's a parent or a faculty member of why not do, you know, everybody at once, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to answer that. One is, you know, it's good for that day. And then the next day, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's worth less. I think the most important thing though, when I, when I answer that is I get back to what Alexandra mentioned about if I'm a parent, I want to know what's going to happen and who's going to take care of my child when some, when, when they're symptomatic. Right. And, and no one ever seems to ask that question is everyone's focused on what happens in August, but what's going to happen in, in November when, you, we do start seeing symptomatic people. And I wanted my child to go to a place that they've really thought this through, they have a robust plan. And so when, when there are positives or they're 
predicted positives or symptomatic that there's there, there, you know, that's where the places have put their, their eggs. So again, there's, there's lots of reasons to argue for or against mass testing, but I think what I've been very impressed with, with this plan is that it's a constant surveillance. It's over time. If the resources are used appropriately, it's a way to, to look at prevalence across the, across the local, the boundaries, but, but really it's focusing on the kids that might get sick and then how to deal with them incredibly quickly to, to, to make a difference in their lives. Thank you so much. And I'm going to ask Alexandra that next question about what happens if someone gets sick? Um, what does isolation quarantine in that process look like? Yeah, so we have um, a very detailed protocol um, for what we do really the minute that someone either calls in with symptoms or fills in that app as indicating that they may have symptoms. And that will trigger a whole triaging process that in most cases will lead to a student coming into the health center uh, to receive a COVID uh, test. Uh, from that point, we have a whole protocol that goes into effect. We, um, while a student is waiting for the outcome of the test, if they're symptomatic, we have uh, temporary housing for them, if you will, a kind of halfway house while they're waiting to know, are they positive, are they negative? Uh, if a student does test positive, um, we have set aside, um, we have set aside multiple residence halls and several other locations on campus that are dedicated set off spaces for both isolation and quarantine uh, purposes. And students would be given those spaces, sent to those spaces, a student who's in isolation. And by the way, I'll pause. I think most people uh, know this, but real quick, the difference between isolation and quarantine, the lived experience of them both is really the same. It's where you are living alone. You are not, you are, you are so physically distant from people uh, completely in all aspects of living. Um, so the lived experience is the same. Isolation refers to people, the, the experience of people who have actually been lab confirmed, tested positive for COVID. And quarantine is referring to people who are isolating um, because they have been in close contact with an infected person. And there is um, concern or suspicion that they could develop uh, symptoms. They could be infected, but the incubation period hasn't played out. So they're in an uncertain period where we don't know, but where it's important for them to be separated so that in their unsymptomatic or unknown state that they are not um, uh, transmitting to people. So that's isolation and quarantine. We have spaces for both. For students who are positive and who are in isolation, they'll have a telemedicine visit um, with our uh, student health center uh, every single day to check on them, how they're feeling, um, and, and there will be services for them if they have any sort of uh, needs, depending upon um, how they're feeling. Our protocol has, if somebody's not responding to their telehealth visit or didn't call in or didn't schedule it, we will send somebody right away to go check on them. Um, within the quarantine itself, we have arrangements with dining services. Meals will be delivered for anybody in isolation or quarantine. We have laundry service, just on the rare possibility that a college student who's suddenly having to go into isolation or quarantine doesn't have two weeks worth of laundry at their disposal. Um, we'll have a laundry service because of the academic model that um, Kim Copeland just described. Um, as long as they're well and feeling well enough, they will be able to continue with their studies um, by but through remote learning, even if their classes were in person or partly in person, those, those courses are being made accessible to students who are having to study remote, not just because they're remote and studying off campus, but even students who are on campus and isolating and quarantining. Um, on top of that, um, our close relationship with Licking Memorial and through conversations with Ohio State, um, we have a lot of resources at our disposal if there are um, students, we hope this is not the case, but if there are students who um, develop more acute uh, medical needs. Um, we have access to a ho uh, the county hospital, Licking Memorial Hospital, just right down the road. Uh, and we have access to OSU experts and to OSU itself for transport um, if our students needed that. Um, in addition, in terms of uh, the follow-up, what would also follow up in addition to isolation and quarantine uh, is uh, the contact tracing process that I described uh, and also the community viral health tracking process that's really the 10,000 foot monitoring of our community's viral health. And I know that there have been probably questions that people have about what is the threshold for what we will do when, would we shut down campus, what would we do? This kind of community 10,000 foot viral uh, tracking tool is really what we are going to use to, um, to kind of adjust and respond and activate all sorts of different uh, measures of containment. I sort of think of it like a, a recording studio and one of those big soundboards that has a lot of dials and levers 
um, as a relatively small uh, university, we have a lot of dials and levers at our disposal and things that we can trigger and turn and activate and modify um, that are things short of formal quarantine, formal isolation, or some sort of formal order from a health department. We can do things like, for example, if through that kind of heat map, we observe what we think may be a cluster of activity within a residence hall. We can say, you know what, we're going to kind of minimize the circulation of people in this part of that residence hall for the time being. Maybe we'll have people take to-go meals. Maybe we'll have people not be using athletic facilities. Maybe we'll have people do remote learning just for a week, just so that we can kind of turn the dial slightly to try to just be aggressive and ahead of, 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 of our containment efforts. Um, so we don't really have one specific metric. When would we shut down? When would we send students home? We have the ability and we're setting up for the possibility of if, 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 if and I hope we don't come to this either, but if the entire campus had to shelter in place, deliver meals to everybody, we can actually do that. And so there would be many, many steps that we would be taking um, in the, on the containment front um, before just, you know, everybody simply um, being home. We're, we're, we're a community and we would operate like a community or like a little city um, to really activate all the different measures. But we're almost, we're better equipped in a city because we really do have all these different mechanisms and these dials that we can turn um, to modulate circulation patterns and interactions to try to get ahead of uh, the transmission. Thank you so much, Alexander. We're gonna shift gears and talk about social and residential life for a little bit, but I reserve the right to come back to you and Peter with some additional questions at the end. So um, Alex, this is for you. Um, we're all thinking about getting back to the Hill and that means move-in day. So I'm wondering if you can just walk through what move-in will look like and specifically if you could talk about the 30 minute window, cause I think it's causing a little bit of confusion for folks. Sure. Uh, thank you, Christy. And uh, first, before I start, I would just like to say, as one of the newest members to Denison's community, I am excited to welcome our students and families to move in day. Um, really quickly, so by now, students have signed up for a move in time slot. And I want to clarify and kind of, as Christy has shared, this time slot is not necessarily the move in time in which we expect the move in to happen, that this is just the window. Uh, in which we expect students and their families and their helpers to arrive on campus uh, and to start moving in. I like to think of this as a drop off to your local airport. Uh, we will ask that you bring two helpers per student. All traffic will arrive at the east gate of campus and that's near the Mitchell Center. Uh, and that then you will unload uh, at the curb quickly. And then once you're done unloading, uh, you will move into a satellite parking lot or a cell phone lot like that of the airport. Uh, and then after that, we're asking that everyone complete the move in within a two hour window uh, so that we can allow for the space and other families uh, to come in and leave campus accordingly. We're asking that families not return to campus after move in so that we can be sure to reduce the density on campus uh, and be able to provide the space for other families to move in. Uh, we know that this is not ideal, but it's important that we are following the physical distancing that we've all been talking about on this call to keep uh, the, the campus density low uh, on move-in day. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, President Weinberg alluded to this um, uh, in his remarks, but um, there's a lot of thinking and conversation happening around social life on campus. And I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about how we're thinking about and planning um, fall on the hill from a student experience perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, as others have shared on this call already, I, I think it's important to remember that this will be a year unlike uh, any other uh, along the overall student experience and particularly in the social uh, space. But we are hoping that we can create a robust student experience, uh, that a ex student experience that's vibrant, students are able to develop intellectually, personally, and socially. Uh, we want our students to live happy, healthy lives here on campus. And so we are thinking broadly about how we can create that community on campus among students, how we can support the academic experience. We know that college is some of the best days of our lives. And so we wanna be able to support students need to wanna to have fun. And with that, we are thinking through how we can remove the barriers to the extent that we can uh, to create the conditions for students to create their own social experience. Uh, and so we're thinking through uh, some creative ideas around resources that become, 
that can become available for students. We're thinking about spaces and how we can think about space differently and allow for some other ways of doing campus events for students. How do we uh, create robust large scale events and also meaningful small scale events? And so a group of us are really thinking about that and more to come um, from our colleagues within student development as to what students can expect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things that um, has been brought up is kind of from, from a student experience perspective, what can they expect with regard to how we will ensure adherence to some of the guidelines, the things we've talked about um, this evening, face mask wearing and social distancing, um, how will we help students understand expectations and then meet those expectations? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and thank you for that. And one of the things that I've been thinking with, with my colleagues in student development is how do we first role model the expectations that uh, we hope our students will live up to. And so part of that will mean our staff really role modeling mask wearing and physical distancing is the first. But we would encourage students to also remain vigilant and kind of uh, buy into this community agreement that we are all in this together and that we are a strong community. You know, I've, I've been here at Denison for 15 days now and I've been struck by the strong sense of community. And so we want to build upon that. Uh, we do believe that it believe, starts with education. And so there'll be a lot of effort uh, before students return to think about uh, creating a culture of responsible behavior. How do we use social media in meaningful ways? How do we do positive reinforcement on campus? How do we build upon our student leaders to really message to their peers responsible behaviors. Uh, we know that also our model um, is educational first. And so in the event that students are having some difficulty understanding expectations that we hope that their peers and our faculty and staff will be able to educate and create that collaborative relationship. We know that also the students are young adults still trying to understand and live in the world. And so I believe that our colleagues on campus will hopefully uh, provide that educational moment for our students and help us to create the culture that we wanna have on campus. Thank you so much. Um, some schools have been talking about a commitment or an agreement or a social compact. Can you talk a little bit about Denison's thinking about that? Uh, yes, I have been working with our colleagues in student development and across the university to think through a social compact of sort that we can uh, collaboratively across the university agree to and buy into. And so our colleagues will be communicating that soon. Uh, and our expectation there is that that is the culture that we want to create. That is the expectations that we hold others to. And we know that our students are the best partners in that. And so we will be talking about what that means day to day in our residential communities and our student organizations. But we also know that when violations occur, we want to be able to be collaborative and educational uh, and lead with those principles and thinking through how we can educate our students on responsible behavior uh, on campus. Thank you so much. And one thing I'll, I'll just um, add to that because I think it's really important for, for students and parents to know, um, we've had students involved in that process and helping us think about and identify what might be in that compact. So again, that the Red Core, the, the students who have been working on that project who've reached out to other students um, across uh, the university to get feedback and input. And so that, that I think that's really special. It's not uh, something that it was created um, by administration, but in partnership with students. So we look forward to sharing that soon. So we're gonna switch gears again, and we're gonna talk a little bit about athletics. So Nan, I'm just gonna ask you to talk about right now, just the thinking and the planning with regard to fall varsity sports. Um, thank you, Christy. First of all, all of you out there, uh, athletes and, and uh, all of our students that are returning, I can't tell you how much we miss you. Um, if facilities could speak and fields and pools, um, they would say they've been very sad. They, they want to be uh, used again. So um, since March, uh, we've been working uh, di diligently at, at how we could come up with a, a plan and protocol that would be able to repopulate our sport teams in the fall, um, but mostly from a health and safety perspective. Um, as you know, the North Coast Athletic Conference is a presidential uh, league driven and faculty driven uh, conference. And we have met extensively in finding ways to um, take it a high level review of all var varsity sports, high density, medium density, low density sports, and how we could 
um, combine that with all of our other expertise from the CDC to our epidemiologists, to our friends at Ohio State, um, to all of our uh, medical uh, personnel on all of our member institutions um, to, to see how we could do this safe, safely. Um, so we have come up with a plan and we really believe in our plan. We really believe in our protocol. I can tell you that every coach, every administrator in athletics and recreation have been, has been involved and they're been committed uh, every day, uh, all day, um, but we are going to need your help. We're gonna need your help to make the plan work. And we trust in your leadership. We trust in your ability to do so. Um, so we will have um, condensed schedules. Um, we won't be able to uh, uh, invite spectators, only campus community students, faculty and staff, obviously with masks and, and social distancing, um, but n not spectators outside of that. We may, we, have had the, we may have the opportunity to carve out special events if we get to our senior games and those types of things. And we can discuss that depending on, on how our, our protocol goes. Um, and um, But most importantly for the families, um, we will be live streaming. And I hope you've had an opportunity to, to visit um, our new website because our um, uh, director of uh, sport information and his staff, Craig Hicks, uh, and his staff have done a remarkable job at um, developing a, an entirely new website. Thank you, Nan. Um, and I ask a question. So beyond varsity sports, I think we probably all agree that just physical activity in general is important, not just for physical well-being, but for mental and emotional well-being. So can you talk a little bit about what fitness and options will be available for students in the fall? Yeah, yes, absolutely, Christy. Uh, student wellness is is a um, you know strategic priority. Um, we want to touch the lives of 100% of the student body. We want to find ways and encourage people um, to move. <laughs> and so we are so fortunate to have a large, beautiful campus with incredible outdoor space. And I, I know as an alum, that's what I uh, fell in love with the very first time I saw the campus. And we'll be taking advantage of that by offering group fitness classes out, out, outdoors. Um, and we will also encourage students to use our outdoor spaces more than ever. We have um, you know, a wonderful uh, bike path. Um, we, we understand physical and mental um, health and how much physical activity can, can uh, play to uh, really help accommodate um, anxiety and, and, and decrease anxiety. So, um, so we will do a lot with outdoor exercise. We have been, all been uh, working very creatively and our instructors have even gained additional certification so we can hold different activities out, outdoors such as outdoor boot camps. Um, we have walks around campus, the bio reserve. Um, we have a wonderful bike path, as I said, uh, runs on our outdoor track, uh, yoga and stretching um, uh, and the campus quad. Um, but, but also we will continue to, to uh, have some of our classes remotely. So you'll have that opportunity as well, our yoga, our Pilates and, and, and so on. The Crown Fitness Center, however, will be open, um, but with modifications and and uh, really restricted uses. And I'm, I'm sure that's true in your local community. Um, we will have significantly reduced numbers allowed in at one time, reconfigured spaces. Um, for va varsity uh, athletes, we've, we have two uh, varsity weight rooms now. We, we've put up a temporary site so we can uh, de-densify the number of athletes at any given time to 10. Um, uh, but, but as you know, strength and conditioning is, is, is imperative for uh, reduce an injury. Masks will be required when entering uh, in all common areas of athletic facilities. And that will be true uh, throughout the Mitchell Center. We've been working um, uh, extensively on enhancing cleaning and, and disinfecting protocol. All of you that know me know, um, you know, uh, we talk a lot about uh, leaving a legacy and my favorite quote, it's not the honor you take with, but the heritage you leave behind. And um, we're, as competitors, um, we, we work best uh, in adversity. So we plan to leave a legacy in how we handled crisis uh, both on and off the playing field. 
Thank you so much, Nan. In the few minutes we have left, I'm gonna take a couple of questions that have come in while, while we've been um, uh, on the session tonight. And then I'm gonna ask Adam to make some closing remarks. So this next question is for you, Peter. I I'm hoping you can answer this. I think you've done some extensive research in this area, but kind of a question that came in um, with regard to, you know, kind of the containment strategy. If we do all of the things that we outlined tonight, if we adhere to the things that we talked about, um, what can we really expect? And so I think maybe put in a different way, does containment strategy really work? Um, and should we expect that, or should we expect that once we have a few cases on campus that it's just gonna result in a significant outbreak? And is yeah. that what we should prepare for? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a really good question. So, so um, we've learned, this is not our first epidemic and we've learned a lot from you know prior prior things that have happened and in fact we've learned a lot in the last in the last five months you know we've had a lot of conversations with people in Wuhan China and people in Italy and people in New York and so we we have a pretty good robust uh, plan that I think that, that that you've been able to, to to put together so I think that is is understanding um, that there likely will be um, positives, right? And I think we've all we're all seeing it every day in the news. And you may even have family members that that have tested positive. But that doesn't mean that that everyone should should give up hope. And it doesn't mean that you know that that everybody goes home and and it's managed, right? So you mitigate additional spread. Um, you make sure that that you take care of the the people that might be sick or have have severe symptoms, as you mentioned, but. But we do know that these plans work. Um, but it's but it's as Alex mentioned, it's not simply one part of a of a, of a wheel. It's it's using all the the different components. And if you use them together, it's it's very effective. You're going to have positive people, um, and it's it's making sure that as a community, you know how to deal with them. That you're you know you don't lose your wits, and you're planning on you know the worst case scenario, and 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 then leading forward with with things that are going to be probably much more positive than that. Thank you so much. Nan, I'm gonna come back to you for a really quick question. Um, we have had actually a couple of these come in. Uh, what about club sports? Yeah, so we are currently uh, working in collaboration with um, Alex Miller and student development and um, looking and assessing uh, uh, club sports in the same way as we're uh, assessing varsity athletics in terms of high density, medium density, and and really low density uh, sports. Um, and if we have the opportunity to put in the same protocol as we can um, and monitor uh, uh, the behavior um, of athletes in club sports, um, we, we want people playing. Um, we want people um, uh, participating and competing, but um, we are also, um, also the health and safety of our students are utmost important. So if we don't feel that we can monitor properly, um, then, then we, we might take a pause. Doesn't mean we have to cancel, we, could, we can postpone, we could do things in the spring that we typically do in the fall. And also there are several club sports that have a larger governing body. We are also looking closely at what they're doing nationally. Thank you, that's very helpful. And I'm gonna send it back to you for closing remarks, but I'm wondering if you can answer one question too before you do that, um, that came in. So akin to club sports, will there just be clubs on campus? So the, the, you know, the groups that students are usually involved in and engaged with, will that be happening? Yep, so simple answer is yes. Um, we're, we're gonna to have to do some things differently, right? But, but the good news is, um, as our students know, we have a lot of student orgs on campus and most of them are not huge, right? They're, they're of a manageable size where student orgs should be able to continue to meet. We're gonna to need to be in larger rooms. We're gonna use our outdoor spaces. It, it, you know, we're, we're fortunate to be in central Ohio where, where the weather actually stays pretty good at least through October. Um, and we'll have to do the kinds of events that students group do. Those are super important, but we may have to do them differently. We may have to do them, you know, we're gonna to have to do them in ways that where people are, you know, where, where people are, are um, adhering to the safety precautions we're going to use around campus. So the, the trick for us is um, we want to be able to do the things we normally do, right? We want to be able to hold classes. We want to be able to, students to meet with faculty. Um, we, we want student orgs to continue to be vibrant. All this is super important. We're just going to have to do it differently. And, and let, me, let me just kind of use that as a closing comment. Um, you know, college is a really special and important time period um, in somebody's life. And, and Denison's a remarkably special place. When our students made the decision to come to Denison, 
um, we accepted the responsibility of doing everything we could to give you a life-shaping um, college experience. And we take that really seriously. So this year will be different, um, but that doesn't mean it can't be a great year. Um, if you are a large university that depends upon huge lecture classes and massive residential halls and lots of commuter students and executive education, all kinds of other things, um, COVID is really hard, but that's not us, right? We're, we are a smaller campus, our, um, a smaller student body on a large campus. We're outside a city, up on a hill. Um, we don't count on large classes. Actually, most of our classes are, are small. They're under 20, 25 students. Can we move to larger rooms? Um, you know, we have residential halls that are of, 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 of reasonable size where we can monitor and, and manage. We can pivot. Um, we only focus on one thing. Um, once people are here, they're gonna largely be here. And that, that's huge for us. Um, and, I, and I guess I would just end by saying something that I think our students know. We're at our best when we're relational and when we're engaged. And in many, many, many ways, the things we need to do as a community to manage COVID really play to our strengths, right? It's gonna require us to do more of the kinds of things we like to do as Denisonians anyways. So um, it'll be a challenging year, but, but I think it could be a great year. Um, and I am excited to, um, to do everything in, in my power to work with our faculty, our staff and our students um, to make sure that every single one of our students, whether you're on campus or remote, um, has a great fall semester. So thank you. Thank you so much, President Weinberg. Thank you all of our leaders for being on the call tonight. And I just wanna remind everybody that you can get updates at reopen.denison.edu and you can email additional questions to uh, reopen at denison.edu. Um, thank you so much, have a great evening.